ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for attending uh, the launch of the Global Risk Report uh, 2009. Uh, we appreciate you coming along. I just wanted to tell you who you're going to be hearing from this morning. We'll be starting with, uh, with the head of the Global Risk Network from the World Economic Forum, Shona Tamborji, and then we'll hear from um, John Drizic, uh, CEO of Oliver Wyman, an MNMC operating company. And John will talk about the, some of the lessons learned from the, uh, the current crisis and uh, ways of mitigating against risks in, in, in the future. We will then hear from Daniel Hoffman, Group Chief Economist of Zurich Financial Services. Uh, and Daniel will analyse um, some of the macroeconomic risks and look at the long-term impacts. And then finally, we'll hear from Raj Singh, who is the Chief Risk Officer of Swiss Re. And uh, Raj will focus on climate change. So without further ado, I shall hand over to my colleague, uh, Shauna. Thank you, Richard. And good morning. And um, thank you all for joining us here. This will be, this is the fourth edition of the Global Risks uh, 2009 report. We've been running uh, the Global Risk Network at the World Economic Forum for the last five years. And when we started it, we chose specifically to look at risks in a way that takes risks from all the different areas, be they geopolitical, economic, environmental, societal, technological, and to consider the interconnections between the risks and the way that that influences both the way the risks can play out, and we look at the way they can play out over a 10 year time frame, and also clearly has implications for decision makers. And with our reports, um, the annual one and others that we do throughout the year, we really aim to take risk issues and frame them in such a way that they provide a basis for discussion. And clearly, in this case, for the annual report, uh, in 10 days' time in Davos, it will be part of the, the discussion there. It will be something that we will provide to all participants um, to help frame some of the issues that they're looking at at that meeting, which has the topic uh, shaping the post-crisis agenda. This year, when we looked and um, spoke to the people that we have in our risk network and worked with our partners on the report on the assessment and the evaluation of the risks. Several risks came to the fore which we had been tracking over the last few years and where we saw that there was an increase in either or both severity and likelihood of these risks manifesting themselves over the coming 12 to 18 months in a particular way. They were fiscal crises, um, a sudden drop in China's growth to 6% or less, which we consider a hard landing as we phrased it when we first identified that risk uh, five years ago now. Um, also, we have the risks related to further falls in asset prices. And we look at a whole set of resource-related risks, in particular around energy and water and land. And finally, we also introduced uh, in our assessment at the beginning of the year of which risks we should look at and track going forward, a new risk which we identified as a lack of governance or gaps in global governance. And we actually considered that through the assessment this year, it came to the fore that this was a very critical risk that actually threaded through the others that we're looking at, be it in the economic front, in the environmental area and energy area, for example. So these are the risks that we have uh, chosen to focus on in the report this year. And in over the next uh, hour, we're going to explore them in a little bit more detail. But with that, I think I'll pass the floor perhaps to yeah, Richard. Yeah, so, John, do you want to take the, the podium? Do it from there? I can. You, yeah, I'm going to it, yeah. Sure. So um, my topic this morning is to look at some of the lessons to be drawn from the current financial crisis, uh, which is obviously center stage right now uh, in everyone's mind. But as, as Shauna said, uh, the Global Risk Report covers more than just the current financial crisis, but all uh, major risks that are, are currently facing the world. So what I'll try to do is uh, pick out a few elements, uh, which I think are uh, things that have become manifest through the financial crisis, but also try to tie them in as to how these lessons could potentially apply to other risks that are covered in the, in the report. So first and foremost, and uh, picked up as, as Shauna said, as a, as a risk of its own this year, is, uh, my first comment is around risk governance, which obviously one of the things that became clear through the financial crisis is that risk governance 
is uh, a vital element of any uh, management framework. And uh, I think what I mean by risk governance here is, is asking the right questions. So it's, not, it's beyond just risk managing the risk, but actually uh, a CEO or board asking the right questions around risk. And it's not, the question is not, what are all the risks we face? Because th that question has often been asked and people come up with lists of, here's the 200 risks that we face. It's really more, what risk can kill our organization? And you know, a specific focus on those and, and how those can be, uh, might manifest themselves. As one development recently, uh, as a result of a kind of change in governance psychology, there's uh, been organizations who have started what you might think of as black swan committees, just focused on uh, uh, these major risks that could potentially kill organizations. So it's sort of one, one uh, major element, ask the right questions, but it's also how the risk function gets positioned in the organization. I think a lot of risk management functions have been positioned as more compliance or back office or control functions instead of elevating the position where they can really shape the agenda of uh, the uh, in a strategic way of the CEO and the board. And a couple more elements of governance. Defining a risk appetite. What, what is a uh, acceptable risk for organizations to take? Businesses need to take risk. There's no doubt. It's a question of how much and which types. And I think uh, oftentimes that isn't well articulated in organizations. And then finally, it's putting in place a culture and organization mechanisms that can act on information that says your risks are now out of line with where you want to be. So all of these, these elements uh, are what I would describe as risk governance. And I think it became clear uh, as the financial crisis has evolved that these weren't in place in the way that they, they should have been in financial institutions. I think as, as you look beyond financial institutions and say, where else might this apply? There's many applications. I'll just pick one. But thinking about other businesses, key aspect uh, of risk that many of them face is supply chain risk, as supply chains have become more global. Uh, this was a focus of the Global Risk Report last year. Uh, I was looking at the risk inherent in supply chains. And I think, again, it's a question of the right questions. Where are the concentrations of exposure in the supply chain that could fundamentally kill the business that we currently have? And those exposures might be to unexpected and uncontrollable events. It's a, it's a deeply strategic issue for many organizations. And yet, uh, there hasn't necessarily been the articulation of what level of supply chain risk is acceptable uh, in a business. And you think about public sector applications of the same idea, think in the pandemics world of uh, there are certain uh, vaccine production or production of vaccines for certain types of pandemics that are highly concentrated. And there's a highly concentrated supply. And then the question is, is that acceptable, or should, does there need to be a more diversified supply? Uh, and I guess, again, it's, it's asking these questions and looking for what's a tolerable level of risk. So these are risk governance things, uh, risk governance as a key issue that's evolved in the financial sector, but I think extends beyond. A second thing I think that became manifest through the financial crisis is that risk models have limits um, and can't be relied on. Uh, as uh, the end goal of, of risk management. And I think you can look within institutions and say they over relied on statistical models for risk prediction and relied on that at the exclusion of other types of models, whether it be stress testing or scenario type models, which might have produced a different answer, but also at the exclusion of more uh, uh, just relying too much on models and not enough on judgment. So I think uh, all models have flaws, they can be useful, but I think what became clear is that the problem wasn't being looked at through enough uh, lenses. I think uh, more broadly in the financial system, investors uh, uh, became clear over relied on uh, ratings uh, from S&P and Moody's as their only mechanism for establishing risk in certain asset classes. And regulators, uh, I think, relied too much on the pillar one aspect of Basel II, the broad Basel II regulation, uh, had some very uh, uh, thoughtful components in pillar two and pillar three relating to supervisory uh, aspects of a bank as, um, oversight as well as transparency, uh, which weren't emphasized uh, nearly enough versus what was emphasized in pillar one, which was more, again, the model-based elements of risk. So I think all of it came clear to all of these uh, participants that uh, models were uh, limited uh, and, and perhaps over relied upon. I think a couple related issues in this regard that I wanted to highlight is that beyond the models themselves, that model builders uh, 
uh, in general, tend to focus where there's data rather than where there's risk. So you get a lot of modeling energy placed where there's uh, deep, uh, rich data, but not necessarily where the biggest risks that organizations face are. And there tends to be an under-focus on things that you can think of as low frequency but very high impact risks because there isn't a lot of data to work with. And I think this comes back to the point I was making around governance in terms of asking the right questions. That if a CEO or board or a government leader frames the right question, it forces the energy of the uh, analytical talent to focus on answering that question rather than working with data that's available to answer a question that's actually less important. I think there was some of that uh, going on in uh, financial services as well. And, and that has, a, again, wide application. Just to pick one, uh, I think one place you can see this happening today is in the energy sector where there's a lot more modeling around the geologic risk of new uh, project development in terms of new production and exploration. Uh, and less around the country risk of where the project would be sited. And so there's this very detailed understanding of the risks in the ground, if you will, but not as much of the analysis of the more kind of qualitative, harder to measure uh, risks above the ground. A uh, third point emerging from the crisis in terms of what lessons we might learn uh, would be that I think our time horizon in looking at risk has been too short. I think in financial services, this became clear in terms of comp incentives being too short term has been you know, written about in terms of the participants, both the broker, mortgage brokers, packagers, as well as uh, executives in the business in terms of having comp incentives which were too short term. The flip side also was that uh, there was an underinvestment in things that were perhaps longer term risk infrastructure uh, to keep pace with the new product development and innovation that was, that was going on. So in looking at this, it was all kind of what's, what's going to happen within the next uh, couple of years rather than what could happen over a more extended period of time uh, with this sort of um, uh, focus at a, a short time horizon. I think, again, thinking about broader application of this thought, uh, uh, I just want to highlight uh, this uh, could have the same impact in the public sector if you think about uh, taking on risk management sort of within political terms of office, uh, whereas most risks are going to extend well beyond that. Just as the focus of the Global Risk Report is on a 10-year horizon, uh, this could be, uh, uh, and some of them obviously go well beyond that, that if you only focus on what can happen in a, a single term of office, uh, you might not invest in the risk management and infrastructure uh, that uh, is necessary and needs to be sustained through a long period of time, but instead will tend to overinvest in what are the headline risks of the day. And I think one of the concepts that we've advanced uh, in prior global risk report is the idea in the public sector of a country risk officer or, or something like that, uh, which where there would be a more sustained, longer term, more coordinated focus on risk management across different segments of the government. Finally, just to come back to a point Shauna made in terms of lessons from the financial crisis uh, around interconnectedness, obviously the, one of the things that was proven is that this was uh, interconnectedness across the globe and different financial sectors was high and rising. You had very accelerated contagion effects coming from a narrow asset class, U.S. subprime, into virtually everything. Uh, and a lot of the connection through in the financial services crisis through liquidity effects uh, which ultimately created a flight to quality that's still there today and uh, pervasive effects uh, 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 in loss of confidence in the financial system. And I think that here, uh, this interconnectedness is one of the key things highlighted throughout uh, the, the prior global risk report, and I think especially this year, and you think about the applications of this uh, in different risk types being uh, very wide, whether it be pandemics, whether it be in resource shortages in food, water, energy, or uh, where one event could trigger a series of, um, of issues uh, that then uh, unfold through time and where a more multilateral uh, response is necessary, more coordinated response, as has been necessary in the financial sector to even move uh, the ball forward. And, so, and where self-interested responses by individual countries or individual actors in the system uh, are not necessarily in the collective best interest and can tend to uh, make it harder to get back to the collective best interest. So those are, uh, in, in summary, those four points I wanted to, to just raise in terms of risk governance being vital, limitations of models, 
uh, too short a time horizon and uh, the interconnectedness uh, rising as being things that obviously became clear through the financial crisis. And while the financial crisis is in a spotlight, and I think there's a, uh, a willingness to learn from these both uh, in, in order to redesign uh, the financial uh, system architecture, uh, I think it should also, it's a good opportunity to learn from them in order to look at other risks uh, highlighted in the global risk support through the same lenses. So I'll leave that there and turn over to Daniel. Good morning. Uh, my job is uh, to walk you briefly in five minutes uh, through the economic uh, risk scene. And in order to do so, do I operate this forward? No. Who is, uh, I do, where? Ah, <coughs> yeah. oh, fantastic. Okay. There we are. Okay. And in order to uh, take off, I uh, reproduce the chart uh, that comes from the risk barometer, which you will find at the end of the book. And uh, there we provide a, a barometer for all the 36 uh, uh, risks uh, in the global uh, uh, risk uh, report. Here I just focus on the uh, eight economic risks that we identified this year and that we also identified last year. What you don't find in the chart is the comparison that, that I made to 2008 in the last two years, we did not provide a risk barometer, so I kind of made it up and uh, I tried to uh, make the comparison for those two years. Of course, I didn't make it up, uh, it's based on the work that we've done for the global risk report. But what's important to see is that uh, we find fewer amber lights, we find more red lights uh, when you look at the overall uh, risk assessment and the economic scene which, uh, if you will, uh, amounts to the uh, fact that uh, the risk landscape, uh, landscape has actually worsened uh, between 2008 and 2009. There are three points that I would like to make. First, uh, the uh, risk of, an economic, of a hard landing in China has increased, or is uh, the same state on red, uh, and I would assume we'll talk about that later in the Q&A. Uh, secondly, uh, we identified as a new red light uh, the retrenchment from globalization uh, and when it comes to uh, emerging markets country as a risk that has increased. And here I would like to say make no mistake, we're talking about the financial crisis as it affects us in the advanced economies, but the people who will suffer most will be the people in the emerging uh, economies and in the developing uh, economies. And uh, at the same time, and I'm truncating history perhaps a bit, over the last 20 years, these people have uh, gained the most from uh, the process of globalization. And this would be a rather inopportune time today to turn uh, the back to globalization, to uh, withdraw from globalization for these countries. And if that, that's why one, is one of the reasons why we identified the risk re as a retrenchment from globalization as particularly acute for the people in emerging countries and in developing uh, countries. Thirdly, uh, we also identified uh, continuous high risk for uh, asset price uh, collapses. You may ask yourself why haven't the global stock markets declined by 40%, 42% uh, was the MSCI World Index last year, isn't that the end of the road? Unfortunately, we shouldn't just look at stock markets and it's not the end of the road as far as asset prices are concerned. 2008 was the year when the financial crisis hit the financial sector. 2009 will be the year when the financial crisis morphs over into the real economy. We will see uh, bankruptcies, we will see defaults, and these bankruptcies and defaults will hit back again in the financial sector. There will be more assets to depreciate, to write down, and we have not seen the end of that particular risk. And that's why we in the Global Risk Network kept the right light on red alert uh, for asset price declines. And lastly, we've introduced uh, new, not new, but uh, we introduced on uh, red now uh, the light for fiscal crisis. Typically, when you look at risks, risks do not depend <coughs> on the state of the world you're in. Uh, in our case, we typically look at the 10-year time horizon and we identify risks over 10 years. What's their liability? What's their severity? And it doesn't matter whether something bad happens right now. The risk is always there. That's not quite true in the economic scene. Uh, economic risks do depend on the state of the world you're in. 
And uh, clearly now, with the financial crisis progressing, with governments now really activating the fiscal pump, uh, the risk of uh, increasing uh, government debt, increasing fiscal crisis has, uh, I would say, doubled, if not tripled, uh, uh, recently. And uh, in the past years, we only looked at fiscal crisis as being determined by changes in demographies. Aging societies put enormous pressure on social security systems and on healthcare systems in advanced economies. Uh, that used to be the only source for fiscal imbalances, if you will, in the past. Now to this, we must add uh, the current uh, necessity to uh, stabilize the economy through uh, fiscal policy action. Now, this is necessary in the short term, but it shouldn't deviate from the long-term need to consolidate uh, fiscal budgets in uh, advanced economies. And this is one of the important messages in our Global Risk Report. You may have short-term concerns, but because you have short-term concerns, the long-term risks don't disappear. Don't crowd out. So that's an important uh, message for policymakers. Don't just lose the long-term perspective. Don't just think, as uh, John just talked about, your single term in office, and don't uh, and say, well, what happens afterwards, uh, that's uh, after, this, after the flood's coming. You need to have a long-term perspective. You need to balance those risks. They're always trade-off and tough choices to make, even uh, in today's situation. Climate change is there and other long-term risks that uh, Raj will talk about, uh, they will demand our attention. Now with that to my next slide. Uh, we've only talked so far about global risks, and we never answered the question, how do those global risks affect individual countries? <clears throat> and in order to talk about that, um, I'm very happy to uh, share with you some of the results that have also been uh, 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 portrayed in the Global Risk Report that we've done. Uh, with a, a dynamic model at Zurich, where we model uh, the impact of global risks on how they affect uh, 160 countries. What you see here now is a, uh, an assessment of how those 160 countries uh, assort themselves with respect to asset bubble risk on the vertical axis and with respect to uh, a couple of economic risks assorted on the uh, horizontal axis. Now, don't get bogged up by the uh, numerical location of each country in that map. The important thing is, where are the countries clustered in the map? You can say that the riskiness, if you will, increases as you move up from the southwest corner of this particular graph up to the northwest corner. So if you have a couple of countries up there in the northwest corners, those would be the countries that are most exposed to economic risk and to asset bubble risk. Now the important uh, uh, message that we have in this graph is it doesn't matter where a country actually sits and we don't identify which country is most at risk. What we identify is which are the countries, which countries are clustered closer together and which countries are not so much together. Now I'll show you the first cluster if you will. Those are the African countries. African countries have almost, some African countries have almost no assets uh, uh, to worry about and therefore they're not really exposed to the asset bubble risk and that's why they tend to be sitting down in the bottom of this particular graph. But when it comes to risk, regional affiliation is not important. Some African countries, the ones like uh, up there in the uh, uh, northwestern uh, countries, that's Morocco, uh, Tunisia, uh, Botswana, Mauritius, and uh, not marked in yellow, but you have RSA, uh, South Africa. Those are countries that have high exposures to asset bubble risk, and uh, South Africa also has a fairly high exposure to economic risk. So one lesson is, when it comes to risk, regional affiliation is not important. What's important is the individual exposure of those countries, and that can uh, actually transgress regional affiliation. Let me show you one other thing. Uh, you have uh, countries like Vietnam, Singapore, Hong Kong, Korea, out there uh, with very high economic risk and a reasonably high asset bubble risk, almost as high as countries like New Zealand, Australia, and the United States. Or look at the BRICS. A bit difficult to see, but I uh, draw through a little uh, uh, circle around that you have Brazil, Russia, India and China close together, together with the Western European countries, 
in that particular risk space. So when it comes to risk, risk tends to be global. Risk tends to be uh, impact most countries, uh, but depending on where they are and with their risk characteristics uh, in slightly different ways. But no country is an island. And certainly when it comes to economic risks, uh, there is no decoupling. And we could have known that a year ago that uh, once uh, those risks uh, occur and actually uh, uh, get activated, all countries are going to be affected similarly because risks uh, do not uh, uh, stop at the border and uh, there is a uh, close connection among those risks. And this brings me to my last point, and that's international coordination. <clears throat> Clearly, if we believe that in the current situation where we are, uh, with a uh, global recession ahead of us, uh, fiscal policy and monetary policy action is required. And if we believe that, we should also believe that these actions need to be coordinated uh, internationally. For if one country does it all by itself, it won't work. It will peter out, it will be ineffective. And so there's been, and you've heard a lot of talk about global coordination, and I would applaud that. Uh, most recently, uh, November 15, you had a meeting of the G20, the, if you will, of the most important uh, countries in the world, making uh, a lot of positive noises about their intention to coordinate globally. And uh, one of the statements that they made was that they would uh, see to it that the global uh, trade round, the Doha round, will be successfully concluded very soon. And the second point was that they would abstain from protectionist action in the next 12 months. There would be a moratorium. Now you all know that that statement <coughs> didn't last longer than 72 hours. After 72 hours, it was broken already. And that's precisely <coughs> the point. You know, you can't just talk, you must walk the talk. You must have credible policy action. And if in the absence of credi po credible policy action, there is a gap in global governance. And that's one of the risks that we newly identified as uh, affecting us, and on that note, I would like to close. Thank you. Thanks, thanks, I'm passing over to uh, Raj Sesha. Okay. What I'd like to do is take a little bit of a, a different view. If you look at, at uh, Shauna, Shauna talked about the term of our report. We have a long-term view. It's not just a one-year view, two-year view, so we have a long-term view. And we also need to pay some attention to the longer-term risks. And if there's three points I'd like to make, one is basically it's about climate change. Climate change is a real risk we continue to face. It is already in motion and there's real impacts. The second message for me would be that, that there are true economic and social impacts that need to be addressed. And the last one is that there are measures that are being taken. So it's a little bit about the risk and, and the focus we take. Now, one of the concerns we do have is that at the end of the day, climate change with all these immediate crisis type type situations we have with the financial crisis and with other things, will it take away investment and decisions around long-term efforts that we need to make towards climate change, adaptation, and will it, vie for, will it get the right attention in this kind of a financial turmoil? So I think that's one important point to make. In terms of the other factors, climate change is real. People spend a lot of time on it. And, and then i just like to drop a little bit of a chart there and in terms of if you look at climate change, this is just giving a simple chart in terms of the actual insured losses uh, on a global basis from natural catastrophes. You can see just the direction, it's all upwards, and the severity is increasing. So, I mean, this is not the full effect all of climate change, there's other impacts in there, including how we populate the different parts of the world. But what you see is that it continues to rise and it's very significant. And, and for me, we need to really spend time and effort towards climate change. And we need to make sure that governments that are making short-term decisions right now to cover fiscal issues don't move away from the investment needed for climate change here. Now, climate change in terms of the economics of climate change, it is real. So this is just one example. But if you look at the overall new information in terms of insured losses just from natural catastrophes in the, in, in, on, around the globe, the total economic losses are around 220 billion. Okay. The, the insured losses are only 40. But when you come back to another element, the loss of life, the loss of life was something like 258,000 people died in natural catastrophes in 2008, globally. And, and then basically, that's in, in a period of one year. So pretty significant. Now, where are the impacts of climate change? The, the impacts of climate change 
are heavily, uh, heavily hitting the, the developing world. So also, are we looking out for the developing world here in terms of what needs to be done there? If you look at the developing world, uh, they have less infrastructure, less financial ability, less kind of financial systems to take care of people. So I think there needs to be a little bit more focus there. If you look at some of the, some of the data that we have in the report, in terms of looking at Africa alone, something between 75 and, and 250 million people will be exposed to water stress by 2020. Now 2020 is not that far away. So we need to take important policy decisions, investment decisions to take action in, in, in this time right now. If you look at the developing countries further, there are also issues in terms of food production, just basic food production. The quality of arable land continues to go down. In some countries, in, in, the, in developing nations, you'll have a reduction of the production out of arable land between 40 and 50 percent. Pretty significant in terms of things. So I mean, for, for, for me, this is an important factor to really pay attention to because right now, huge amounts of efforts and diversion has gone there. Now I come back to the issue, why talk about it now? This is the year of Copenhagen. And the year of Copenhagen is very important. It's the follow-up to, to the Kyoto Protocol. At the end of the day, the Kyoto Protocol has not been as successful as we'd like to have seen it. But Copenhagen is a chance to really try to address some of the climate change issues. Now the question is, will governments be able to commit to reduction in economic growth, or not reduction in economic growth, but less expenditure, or less expenditure towards this whole climate change efforts that need to be done for adaptation and other elements there. Now here in terms of, just to give you a, one last comparison on the economics of it, is that in, in the developing countries, less than 2% of, of the, uh, the GDP is spent towards insurance and risk transfer coverage. In the, in the, in the advanced world, it's, it's double. It's double that. So it's a pretty significant difference between, again, so the impact of climate change, of course, will affect all of us, but all of us will hit the poorer countries more, in a more severe manner. Now, in terms of what's being done about it and what, what can be done about it is continued investment, but a lot of private-public partnership work needs to be done. And here, Swiss Re takes a very active role, and we've been working with elements and participating in things like the World Economic Forum to help develop these kind of policy-type decisions and discussion with stakeholders. And in terms of real specifics, I mean, it, we provide, we're, we're providing <coughs> specific weather-related coverage in countries, so where we can help subsistence farmers benefit from, uh, well, benefit from weather disasters in terms of simple ways of doing it. In India, we've done something where we're covering, covering 350,000 subsistence farmers in terms of uh, providing them with, with uh, protection against uh, crop failure. We've just done a recent transaction in Malawi that's been a kind of a, a public-private partnership type element with the right stakeholders involved in discussion where basically we're, we're protecting maize growers from, from a, a, a drought event. So I think we need to spend a great deal of time on this, but what this brings is the whole concept of risk management back into the whole climate change element and driving towards from climate risk mitigation, which is, which is being done now, driving it more towards adaptation. So again, I think those were the kind, of, the kind of messages I wanted to give you. The main thing is that we cannot lose sight of some of the longer term risks that are real, and climate change is one of those. I'd like to turn it back to Richard Elliott. Thanks, Thanks Raj. Thanks. Um, so we'll now we'll start the, the Q&A, and if you can say um, what or organization you're from and your name and who the question is for, and uh, please um, wait for the microphone. Thanks. Just while we're waiting for the microphone, I'd like to ask one question. Why um, have we been so unsuccessful at dealing with risk? I mean, I mean, this is the fourth of, of these reports, and look at the situation we're in now. Why, people, why don't people not, not heed the, the warnings, or is, is it the complexity of the matter? Who would like to? John? <laughs> um, well, I think each of the risks in its own right is a complex matter, whether you're dealing with the financial uh, markets, or you're dealing with pandemics, or you're dealing with climate change, as Raj said. Each in its own way is complex. It requires multilateral coordination, in some cases public-private sector cooperation. These aren't easy things to build. So I think it's easier to identify the risk than it is to develop a practical mitigation strategy. I think as, the, uh, as time has progressed, I think there has been progress in some areas. I think to think of climate change, I think the IPCC has been an international 
coalition that has made progress. I think WHO has made progress to some degree on pandemics issues, but there's still a long way to go. And I think, so I wouldn't say that no progress has been made, but I think, uh, I don't think risk has hit the consciousness uh, as much until this year as, uh, and now that it has, I think it's the opportunity to say, let's learn from this. We know that these risks can manifest themselves in global major crises. So, and that the same thing could happen in other parts of the risk spectrum. So let's kind of work towards something that is the type of solution that's necessary. So hopefully there'll be some more of a motivation given what's happened. Okay, thanks. Um, oh, Good morning, Adam Smallman, Managing Editor from Dow Jones. Uh, my question is for Raj and Daniel. Um, uh, trust is what's absent. What's going to take, uh, what's uh, going to bring trust back? One can't trust our financial advisors, Mr. Madoff. One can't trust the regulators. One can't trust the regulators, not just in financial services, but in energy. Um, uh, one can't even trust the politicians because we don't know what their plans are for big industry. We don't know whether Citigroup will be owned by uh, the US government. We don't know whether the car companies are going to be owned by the US government. How do you recover trust? Sure. Uh, this is the uh, big question, and I tried to allude to that a little bit by saying uh, uh, the only way. You know, trust is something that you collect over many, many years, credibility and trust, and you lose it overnight. And then it takes another uh, uh, umpteen years to regain that lost credibility. How do you do it? Uh, you need to, uh, what I said, you need, governments need to walk the talk. Everybody who makes a big announcement needs to be specific about that. And you know, when governments come out and say, we're gonna do such and such, we're gonna do fiscal policy uh, uh, measures, they need to say when they do it, they need to say how they're gonna do it, by when they will have executed it, and then they need to follow up with action. Only action will uh, uh, support the kind of trust building exercise that's necessary. Let me add one more point. There is a lot of talk about now that, that as you say, regulation failed. How can you trust regulation? There's gonna be a lot of pressure in the political arena to rebuild regulation. <coughs> I would say uh, that's probably right. Uh, regulation did fail in a couple of things, but don't go and try to regulate behavior. People will always act in their own self-interest. You need to account for that. If you want to strengthen regulation, you should take out excessive risk, and regulation should target to excessive risk-taking, but regulation should not build and target uh, behavior. If I could just do two things from my side. This is more from an insurer and reinsurer standpoint. Reinsure, we, we have to live by trust because it's our promise to pay that matters at the end of the day to our customers because that's the main thing we have out there. So the customers have annually or constantly, they have a moment of truth. They get paid on claims, which is a more important factor. But to back that, what you really need is a capital and a balance sheet that's strong at the end of the day because that does bring trust back in some manner where people can see it physically. And that strong balance sheet means strong capital but also a perception of de-risking, because you may even have assets that are not quote-unquote highly risky, but if there's a perception they're risky, so you need a kind of a de-risk balance sheet, you need a strong capital base, and you need those moments of truth to come again and again where you pay out. Yeah, just quickly, to follow up with Daniel, just quickly on that sure. point. Um, you, you said that uh, you know, this is what governments need to do, is they need to have these very clear sort of contractual arrangements. Are we seeing that? Uh, thanks, yeah, Daniel Sullivan from the Investors Chronicle. Um, it's not quite clear, there's a question for Daniel, but it's not quite clear in the copy in, in the book, but it was quite clear on your slide that um, you've got um, kind of, you know, along the axes of um, asset bubble risk and economic risk, you've got Russia, India, and China kind of grouped fairly near each other. Then there are what seems outliers along the risky end of the spectrum in both senses was the US, New Zealand, and Australia. I'm just wondering kind of what quantum of uh, extra risk they've got. I mean, should investors be saying, right, that those Anglo-Saxon economies are obviously more buggered than Russia, India, and China. That's where I'm going to be putting my money over the next few years. And also where our great Anglo-Saxon economy here is in terms of those two risks. And leading into another question, if you've got the time to answer it or consider it, on top of that, um, 
given, given how much you know, our economy and the US and arguably the other ultra-liberalized economies relied on all, all the smoke and mirrors, extra liquidity provided by securitization, the various risk offsets, all those kind of multipliers, would you agree, given that you're meant to be looking out 10 years with the analysis of some people, that for us in these kind of economies, we're facing, we're facing something of a parched world with um, you know, nothing like the amount of credit we've seen in the past kind of two decades and very low growth, and we're going to be extremely limited in the long term for the next 10 years? Well, thank you. Uh, this is a, uh, those are very important questions. Let me just take the second one first. And uh, I would, uh, unfortunately, I have to push back a little bit. Uh, our point in the risk report is not to make forecasts about uh, economic developments. And I think we should refrain from that. This is not uh, the comparative uh, knowledge that we bring to the table. Our point is to identify risks and to put them down on the map and sort of call them as they lay on, on, the, on the map. And uh, so I may have an opinion as a uh, chief economist for a large financial services provider about where to, how does risk shape up then in the actual world, and I'm happy to talk to you about that after this conference in my personal capacity. But as far as the global risk report is concerned, we don't do these type of forecasts. Now, second, uh, first, uh, you're doing first uh, 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 set of questions. You know, what makes it that the United States, New Zealand, and Australia are right up there and uh, are exposed to? Uh, the major driver of those uh, risks are the continued exposures to asset bubbles and uh, to uh, bursting asset bubbles. And as I said in my presentation, uh, that we haven't seen the end of that story simply for the fact that now the, the cycle jumps from the financial uh, uh, area to the uh, real economy and then we're going to see continued uh, uh, pressure on uh, financial asset uh, prices. Uh, Russia, the BRICS uh, are up there as well. Uh, some of that is uh, uh, their interlinkages uh, uh, with uh, the uh, uh, real economy in, 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 in advanced economy. In the case of Russia, you have some specific asset bubbles also with respect, for instance, to uh, resource bubbles. Uh, as you know, in, uh, Russia was very much dependent uh, uh, on, on oil prices and gas prices uh, developments. And as uh, you all know, these prices have crashed in the, the most recent months, which exposed Russia indeed to an economic shock uh, on its uh, fiscal balance side. Um, the lady at the back on the right, please. Hi, um, <coughs> I'd like to thank Raj for giving a really a clear uh, presentation. Uh, I'm not from this world, and the other three, at the risk of me being thrown out, was like Kafka, Disney, you know, Alice in Wonderland, and the Circumlocution Office. What exactly does everybody do at the World Economic Forum? The, the greatest brains in the world, the leaders of the world, are you not deeply disappointed with what has happened from last year to this year? I mean, you know, just what you know, you, you identify all these risks. You've got Israel and Palestine wrong completely, which will probably be solved by water in the end. But you know, why has nobody acted on, on all these risks? I mean, are you not deeply disappointed and ashamed of how the world has panned out? Sean, do you want to make a crack at that? Well, in, at the forum and here and all of us, and kind of, we're all in this world together. And uh, clearly, what we have currently is a huge focus on an economic and financial crisis that's of immediate concern touching people on the streets here and in the Middle East, across the world. Um, clearly, there's, there are problems. Clearly, we're looking at risks. We're looking at things that are negative, and as you've raised two, two areas of risks which are highly interconnected. And indeed, we believe that this crisis, the economic um, situation, could have been very detrimental to these situations as well. So of course, to the extent that um, we, um, by our business, are being pessimistic and looking at the, the ills, <coughs> at the same time, the whole purpose of our work is really to try and frame the discussion to raise awareness, to build awareness about the types of issues you've mentioned and others, and to try and at least provide a platform for discussion around them. Action has to be taken by the people who have that legitimate power to act. We um, can facilitate the discussion and, as I say, raise awareness, 
and hopefully suggests that people work towards things over the long term. Unfortunately, there are no quick fixes. And as humans, I think all of us uh, feel that is unfortunate, but uh, true. Thanks. Um, gentleman with picture. Hi, I'm Nathan Skinner from Strategic Risk. I'd like to ask um, Raj and Daniel um, about new, new li liabilities stemming from the financial turmoil. Um, we hear a lot about a liability crunch following on from the uh, credit crunch. Um, I was just wondering what your views are on that um, and when do you think we'll start to see that emerge? Well, in terms of, in terms of the, the current crisis, obviously there always are issues out there because there is coverage provided, but this is not something directly related to the risk report. So if you want to, perhaps we can have a dialogue later if that's okay, because it's not directly related to the risk report, or I can give a quick one, that basically there will be litigation out of such kind of an event. And if there's coverage provided against that litigation, obviously there will be claims. And I would just add uh, to Raj that uh, we, yes, we have identified in the report a risk that's uh, related to liability, but we don't mean that particular risk, we mean the general nature in the, in the development that uh, uh, people uh, don't tend to want to be responsible for their own action anymore. They'd rather go uh, address them to a court and uh, file uh, liability claims uh, on someone else and try to get restitution from someone else. And this is a ten trend that we've seen emerging and developing over the last 20 years. And uh, this trend, if unbroken, uh, can cause uh, uh, serious problems for the world. That's what we mean uh, when we talk about liability. And the gentleman with the uh, brown tie. Uh, Paul Davis from the Finance Times. A uh, question for any of you, really. Um, it seems pretty likely, but almost certain, that we're going to emerge from this crisis with fewer, larger, more powerful financial institutions. Uh, do any of you think that's remotely sensible? And if so, why? And if not, uh, should we be doing something about it? Or, or what? Well, again, I mean, I, I think this is a very good and fair <laughs> question to ask, and uh, uh, some of that consolidation is right now uh, 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 progressing. We see that uh, in a couple of investment banks that uh, cease to exist, and uh, we see other investment banks uh, uh, seeking their uh, uh, rescue uh, under a different charter. So clearly, uh, a crisis like this has a uh, uh, catalytic uh, impact on, on these type of structural issues. But again, I would say that it's not our report's purpose to make a prediction about uh, the future state of the financial world. But you've got to identify risks. Uh, exactly, but you know, if, if, if we will make an assessment over next year, uh, look at the landscape again, and if we should say that uh, the changing structure or the change structure in the financial sector poses a new risk, and poses a risk that qualifies to be a global risk. I would uh, uh, you know, alert you to the, the qualification that we have in the back of the book, what constitutes a global risk. It needs to impact at least uh, three uh, 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 regions, uh, large regions, on at least two continents with a certain severity. And uh, uh, you know that, that remains to be seen whether that's uh, uh, the issue. But John, do you want to have something? Perhaps just then, as Daniel quite rightly said, it's not an area that we look at uh, for the purposes of the report, but it is an area that um, going forward, the World Economic Forum, uh, we do a lot of work on scenario, and indeed um, coming out of this crisis as we look at the governance issues around it, some of the work of our scenario program is looking at the new financial architecture and positing different scenarii that uh, might emerge, and one of which would be a different landscape in terms of institutions worldwide, and perhaps uh, you know, changes in power. So that's something that uh, will actually be being released quite soon, and maybe that some of you might like to follow up on, on that project. On well, it, it just seems in terms of everything that you said about interconnectedness and how we should view all these other risks through you know, the prism of interconnectedness now, you know, fewer larger financial systems in the world exacerbate that very Yes, it will, but we don't know whether there will be new players in the year or two years from now that uh, uh, enter the financial services sector and uh, change the rules of the game. And, you know, it would be preposterous for us to uh, predict uh, the emergence of new players. Um, definitely the yellow town, just, uh, just okay. Hi, I'm Ed Conway from the Telegraph. You, you talked about uh, the risk of financial crises. 
uh, sorry, rather, fiscal crisis. I'm just curious about um, the fact that in the past year we've seen a number of countries having to go to the IMF for support. Um, I'm wondering whether this, given the countries here that you've mentioned, the US, the UK, Spain and so on, most of them have rather large uh, current account deficits as well. Are you concerned that this might manifest itself in current account crises, um, balance of payment crises that involve a developed country having to go for help with the IMF? I mean, it seems very much interconnected with the fiscal crisis. And likewise, are you concerned, given that Spain, uh, Italy and France are part of the Eurozone, about whether this might exacerbate um, imbalances in the Eurozone which could undermine its Euro's um, existence, really. Well, uh, it's always been uh, Milton Friedman's uh, belief that uh, the validity and the viability of the Eurozone will eventually be tested in its first uh, large and big economic crisis. So we may be in that situation uh, where we have, uh, if you will, the litmus test uh, of the survivability of the Eurozone. At this point in time, I would still say that the political commitment to uh, maintaining the Eurozone is very strong, and uh, I don't see uh, any reason to assume uh, that that will be an issue. But you're absolutely right. Uh, the uh, fiscal crisis risk has ramifications for the rest of the world. And at this point in time, with the type of borrowing and with the magnitude of borrowing that we're seeing in some of the advanced economies, they're threatening to uh, crowd out some of the emerging markets uh, that depend on international borrowing uh, to maintain their economies and strive. And again, this is one of the bigger risks. And uh, we, you know, we, we allude to that by saying, you know, there's a fiscal crisis risk, there is a uh, current account uh, imbalance risk, which is tightly uh, connected to the fiscal crisis risk. And there is also a, <laughs> if you will, a forex risk. We have it, uh, specifically in our analysis, we have a decline, a further decline of the dollar. And that could all be uh, reflective of uh, the type of situation that you mentioned there. So do you have any particular idea about whether the likelihood of a developed country having to go to the IMF is possible? Um, like uh, the UK in 1967. Uh, I'm not sure where uh, uh, that's a realistic scenario at this point in time because most of these countries certainly the bigger countries that are not overly indebted, like in Iceland uh, that had a huge uh, a current account deficit in magnitude of about 18% of GDP and had a huge uh, uh, debt in, 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 in other currencies. Most of these countries are not indebted in, in foreign currencies. Most of these countries have functioning central banks that are perfectly capable of uh, maintaining uh, the, the solidity of that particular country. I see right now uh, the bigger risk being played out in the emerging market area that the uh, advanced economies are crowding out those emerging markets. Um, a gentleman on the front here with a strap. Hi, Gary Duncan from the Times. Um, Gary, could you this way for the. Sorry, geez. he can hear you, but the people in the back are not sure. Sorry, Gary Duncan from the Times. In your. Um, uh, summary sheet, you highlight the hard landing uh, in China as a danger, and you've mentioned that several times in the presentation, but you haven't really elaborated on either how you would see that playing out or on what you see the consequences of that being. Could you just expand on that particular scenario, which obviously has big implications? Uh, right. Uh, this is a, the, we, first of all, we define the hard landing in China as China's growth rate uh, to drop below 6%. And uh, we all know that uh, China is trying to do everything uh, to keep that, prevent that from happening. Uh, but we fear and we see now in most recent data that this is actually uh, is happening and that China is right there. Now, this has a uh, most dramatic impact first uh, for China uh, domestically. Uh, we know that China has a huge pool of migrant labor, uh, so domestic Chinese citizens that move from the uh, western uh, parts of China, the rural areas, to the eastern seashore uh, to find jobs there. Some of those people are, uh, uh, we will call them illegal uh, migrants uh, because they're not papered, they're not uh, registered uh, by any means. Uh, they're most likely to fall through the cracks. Uh, which means they're going to pose a, an enormous social problem for China that China will have to face and that China will have to cope. So that's number one. And uh, the people uh, that are going to fall through the cracks in China are estimated to be in the millions. Obviously, this is a large country. Secondly, 
the fact that China now has a, a domestic economic problem feeds back into the long-term challenges that China has to face in the environmental area. We all know that China is very exposed uh, when it comes to uh, maintaining clean air, uh, uh, secure and safe water supplies, and uh, all sorts of issues that we think uh, we may have addressed in the advanced economies, but China clearly has not addressed those. Now, the fact that China is entering an economic downturn of some uh, uh, magnitude uh, will endanger uh, the maintenance and uh, uh, the support uh, in these areas. Again, this has a tremendous feedback uh, for the domestic policy situation in China. So the risk of China hard landing, uh, which uh, seems to be uh, materializing in this year, has a tremendous uh, domestic, policy impact, uh, domestic policy impact in China. Now, on top of that, uh, we'll see the uh, global ramifications of China. Clearly, China has been uh, a supplier uh, for uh, uh, the uh, world economy and, also, and, 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 and has also been a, an importer of import <coughs> resources. China uh, had, it has a natural resource uh, deficit in a number of critical uh, uh, inputs for manufacturing. And as China uh, uh, virtually implodes, uh, this will have an the rest uh, of uh, the global economy already see major uh, natural resource uh, exporters in Latin America suffering now from a, a rapid uh, decline in uh, demand uh, from China. And we'll see uh, the uh, similar impact on uh, the trading partners that China has uh, within uh, the Asian uh, cohort. Um, the young gentleman in the back row, the uh, Karen Stacey, also from the FT. Um, you touched on uh, supply chain risks, and I just wondered whether you could um, go a little bit further into that. I wonder how much of a, a global risk you, you feel that, that the risks of major institutions failing are to uh, the rest of the economy through supply chains. And if this is uh, a major risk, whether there is a role for governments in getting involved in boosting those chains. Yeah, I think. Uh in terms of supply chains, uh, I was taking it at two levels. I mean, one is the level of the individual corporation, where I would say, similar to the risks of individual financial institutions, the question should be asked for those companies as to what what are the supply chain risks that could put them out of business. And that, that will vary in terms of its intensity, just as it would have varied in the financial crisis in terms of how exposed individual institutions were to the mortgage sector, to some of the other uh, classes where asset, asset prices dropped rapidly. So I think that there's not a single answer to that for individual companies. What I'm encouraging is, in, as it relates to supply chain, for people to, uh, to ask that question and look at it, uh, and, and look at it at, at particular areas that could potentially be most significantly impacted by some of the other global risks. So could a hurricane, earthquake, pandemic, uh, 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 you know, food security problem, et cetera, could a certain supply area, area of its manufacturing, a certain element of the supply chain basically out of uh, commission for a while, and how would that damage the supply chain of the individual company? Because their response could be to diversify their supply chain, it could be to uh, potentially own part of their uh, supply chain if they're worried about uh, effects um, of, of, uh, on, of the supplier itself. So I think uh, the answer isn't, uh, isn't a simple one, but one which I think differs for individual companies. So it's more, uh, could it manifest it itself in the same way and put someone out of business? Yes, uh, but not necessarily everyone. At the government level, what I was saying is that there are certain, certain types of the risk, such as vaccine supply, which are potentially areas where it's more of a public uh, sector issue than a private sector issue to look at concentration of supply and decide again whether that that type of concentration is warranted or whether there is uh, there are ways to manage the risk differently through more international uh, 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 cooperation and potentially again diversification of supply. I think when, as people have analyzed supply chains in the past and we've been involved, they found sort of surprising concentrations that didn't, didn't necessarily know existed until they went deeper. Uh, and I think that's one of the things that uh, I think, uh, from, from our experience, would suggest that this should be elevated as a risk to be looked at. But I wonder, sorry, in the, in the public sphere, apart from just the, sorry. Uh, in the public sphere, apart from the public health implications, um, 
corporate supply chains uh, create a risk in, in the public sphere as well. And we've obviously seen this at the moment with the, the UK government thinking about whether it needs to, to get involved in ensuring supply chains. Um, and I just, uh, on, a, on a global level as well, whether, I, I just wonder whether there's a role for governments to come together to do something like that, to provide a scheme where they, they either ensure or simply just stump up the cash to keep supply chains moving on a corporate level. I think in the main I see it as, a, it as a private sector issue, but it's not to say there aren't some areas where potentially that could happen. Raj, are we going to jump? Well, I would say uh, if you're about to open a can of worms, if they, uh, you would call uh, for the government to step in. You know, governments should only step in if uh, a risk is systemic. And I don't see supply chain risk as devastating it may be for a particular company, and perhaps even in an industry, but I don't even see that it would affect the whole industry. I don't see supply chain risk to have a systemic component. 